Mario is the CEO at MuralNet, which is an organization that works with native communities across North America to design, build, and implement sustainable tribal networks. Um, Mario wears lots of hats. Uh, and she's done a lot of great work across this space, whether it's testifying in front of Congress to bring about regulatory change to help connect these communities, or actually climbing towers herself uh, to, to work, work with partner communities to get connected. So with that, I'll hand it over uh, for Mariel's uh, recorded video. I believe she is on to answer questions as well. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me. My name is Marielle Triggs, and I run a small nonprofit called MuralNet. We've been working since 2017 with tribes in order to make their own LTE networks. Private LTE networks driven by magma, such that tribes would own and control their own internet feature. Now, back in 2017, our pilot network, we worked with the Havasupai tribe at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's an eight mile walk or a helicopter ride in order to get there. With half a day of labor and $15,000 of equipment, they were able to bring broadband speeds down to the center of their village. That network sparked a movement. It was part of a endeavor in which we had to use 2.5 gigahertz spectrum and get a special temporary authority in order to get access to it. At the time, spectrum and licenses were frozen, but the FCC was able to see what was possible when tribes had control of their own spectrum, especially the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. Since then, the FCC worked hard and had a rural tribal window in which hundreds of tribes applied and gained access to the 2.5 spectrum over their lands. Currently, 1.9 million people have spectrum now controlled by a tribal entity over their heads. What that means is in the next year, you're going to see hundreds of tribal networks being built. Tribal leadership has seen through the horrors of the COVID epidemic the importance of having broadband availability for their people. Whether it's the health disparities, education, whether it's economic development, or just being able to have the social interaction, it's so important that tribes have the ability to connect their own people. We have worked with dozens of tribes now in order to build private LTE networks. We've worked with colleges, we've worked directly with government, we've worked with economic councils or educational departments. Magma has been pivotal in this in making control of that network accessible. And they've been able to see what parts of running a network they want to do themselves, what parts they want to invest in, and what parts they might want to partner with outside entities. So here's a call out I have to you. Be a good partner. The open source code that you have been working on and the creation of Magma has been huge in giving tribes control over their own internet access future. So please, Continue to build coalition with tribal partners. Learn what tribes need, their motivations, who they want to connect and how. And design around tribal partners. If tribes who are the least connected folks within Northern California are made to have control of their own spectrum, what that would mean is it's going to help many others along the way. School districts, small rural towns, everyone would have easier access to broadband with your help. The user interface, figuring out what metrics tribes need, network management options. These are all parts of a network that you have control over and that you can make easier to access for our tribal partners. So please be a part of this movement. Contact us at info at muralnet.org. Work with us and work with the Native Nations to design, build, and control their own internet access future. Thank you for all you do. My name is Jesse Archer. I'm a consultant with the Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone Reservation. In partnership with MuralNet and Cisco and leveraging the recently acquired 2.5 gigahertz spectrum through the rural tribal window and our recent application uh, with the FCC, we are going to be launching an emergency 4G LT network for our residents and citizens of the Lone Pine Pike Shoshone Reservation. This network is going to have massive impacts for the community. Uh, in terms of government operations, education, distance learning, um, community health, our emergency response services, and particularly uh, protecting cultural resources, which is somewhat unique uh, to our location uh, in California. The Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone Reservation is as close to a true democracy, a pure democracy as you can get. While they do have elected officials, 
In order to pass uh, laws, Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone's entire voting population must gather to vote to pass major ordinances and laws that affect the whole tribe. So when the pandemic hit, community, county, state, and even federal guidelines from the CDC prohibited large gatherings. So that effectively froze our government. And we needed a, a way, we need a way to be able to conduct critical government operations and communications. Our communities are on the unfortunate end of the digital divide. We do not have wide broadband access for all homes and particularly, most importantly, all students. Because of the coronavirus, uh, schools had to go to distance learning. So if our students, our tribal students, did not have a stable internet connection, they were not able to participate. We're looking to provide stable internet access to every single home on the reservation. The Eastern Sierra and Paiute tribes in general protect some of the largest uh, concentrations of cultural resources in the Western Hemisphere. We have uh, petroglyphs that are thousands of years old and uh, they are sacred, absolutely sacred to our people and uh, priceless and they are often vandalized and uh, often stolen where we have no way to uh, surveil or protect these cultural resources. Um, literal graves, uh, campgrounds, um, uh, gathering and ceremonial places, uh, important to the people. This network will allow us to monitor and protect these cultural resources where we have never been able to before. So Lone Pine's equipment, our, 4G, our 4G LTE network, uh, is comprised of enterprise grade equipment we are using airspan equipment, um, buy cells. Um, we are testing multiple frequencies. We also uh, have uh, equipment uh, from Cisco and the Freedom Fi and Magma software are at the core of our network. And uh, this software um, enables small rural tribes like us with minimal resources to manage and operate on the same level as any other nation state. Also where uh, we would be required to hire consultants, third-party consultants um, that are very, very expensive and often out of our budget, the Magma uh, user interface and the orchestrator uh, allow us to set up and manage our own networks with minimal training. I myself set up our very first uh, CPE just the other day when we were testing our network. Uh, it was very, very easy to use and uh, the concepts were easy to understand. Uh, I am the first person and with the first device to be attached to Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone Reservation's emergency network. So we have our Cisco switch to our Freedom 5 Magma to the buy cells integrated antenna and base station to your Microtech CPE, which is then your computer's attached to it. Which then going right into my brain. And I-9, making it all happen. <laughs> what we're looking forward to in the future is working even closer with uh, Freedom Fi and the Magma software, and hopefully our partners at Cisco and MuralNet um, for training purposes. The interface and the software was easy enough for me to use uh, as a first time user with almost no background. And what we would like to do for sustainability purposes is build capacity internally as tribal nations. And this means um, we're going to need people who know how to run the Magma software uh, very well <clears throat> because this is what we will be running our networks from. What we would like to see is developing even closer relationships so we can learn from Fre Freedom Fi and train our own people and vice versa. What I see in the future is once we build our own expertise uh, as tribal nations, necessity will bring about the most creative uses of this technology, of these networks. And the most creative solutions uh, that we will see coming in the future will come out of Indian country.
And uh, that's what I'm really excited about and looking forward to. My name is Phil Fowler. I'm the IT director at the Bishop Paiute Tribe. We partnered up with MuralNet and um, got some additional funding from the First Nations Institute. And uh, we put together a, um, the beginnings of a 4G LTE wireless network uh, that we're hoping to deploy to uh, members of the Bishop Paiute Tribe community um, in order to you know, facilitate distance learning, telemedicine, and uh, you know, just overall quality of life improvements. Mm -hmm. The internet in this area has been a little bit spotty over the years. And although it's been getting better by dribs and drabs, it's just the quality isn't what we think we should expect. And so we're working hard to try to um, fill that gap um, for the tribal members. This is a big experimental project. That's the main goal that, that we're doing right now is experimentation. Since the middle of December, um, probably since early December, we've been using the Magma Core uh, in order to deploy um, internet services over our, um, over our LTE network. In our project, we have deployed six LTE radios, two 10 watts, a 20 watt, and three quarter watts. We're evaluating how those work in, in our given environment. Residences are a little bit spread out, and there's kind of a lot of trees around, and so we're just kind of covering all our bases and seeing what technologies work the best. The 60 node Bs are managed in Magma. We also have uh, 43 current subscriber cards available in Magma. They haven't been all put out yet, but we're getting ramped up on deploying more and more uh, in the very near future. And uh, in fact, we just had uh, another one today uh, come in and tell us that they were on our experimental pool. They told us that they were moving and asked if they could take the, the connection with them. So I think that really s speaks a lot to you know how much they how much they want the, the wireless internet and how happy they were with the service. Because if it's soft, they wouldn't be asking you to take it with them. We manage that all from the Freedom Fly Orchestrator, and um, uh, you know it's got a beautiful dashboard that helps us to visualize information and uh, you know figure out what's online and what's not, and easily easily reboot the service if we need to, which. Thankfully, it hasn't happened very much, but because we're still getting everything squared away and figuring everything out, there's little hiccups here and there. Sure. But by and large, it's been a really smooth, uh, a smooth situation. Once we got it up and running online, it's, it's been running fairly solidly. I've found that it's user-friendly in that it's intuitive. You know, so I can, I can look at the dashboard, and I don't really have a lot of experience with LTE networks. Uh, this is the first time that I've ever even approached the subject. So um, when I'm able to look at the dashboard, get an idea of what it is that I'm looking at and how it relates to one another, you know, it just makes the system a little bit more intuitive for somebody like me that you know, uh, just wants to get the thing up and running quickly and doesn't have access to the kind of expertise that, um, you know, the, that uh, hiring a consultant might, might, might bring in. But since we're in a remote area, you know, we're largely on our own. And so we need to be able to figure out what's going on with our network and kind of understand the nuts and bolts of it. It helps in affordability too, because we don't need to pay, uh, you know, a really strongly experienced uh, technical staff. It would be nice if we had access to something like that, if we had access to, you know, uh, uh, experienced engineers that we could hire, mm -hmm. but there's nobody like that in the local labor pool. So we have to be able to, uh, uh, deploy technologies that we can manage on our own. Well, that's one thing that Magma really does well is take out a lot of that complexity for you, and 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 it allows you to focus on, you know, the basic things like like getting your customers subscribed, and uh, you know, it just allows you to to manage it with a little bit less uh, expertise than you might have had. <laughs> or have access to. Mm -hmm. There's about two thirds of uh, people living on tribal lands don't have sufficient connectivity if having any connectivity at all to the internet. And COVID has really shown why this is such an important issue. Um, unlike other countries though, the issues when it comes to getting connectivity on tribal lands isn't necessarily one of infrastructure uh, in the sense of uh, there's usually fiber to almost every school. So there is some sort of high speed connection to almost every village. And, and also electricity for the most part is also present. What it often is, is what we call the first mile, otherwise known as the last mile. 
So getting it from that centralized place and distributing it to homes, that seems to be one of the biggest issues. Uh, and that's where making those kind of networks operational and in control of tribes has been one of our biggest goals. So how do we make sure that they can own that infrastructure? Luckily, carrier grade uh, LTE equipment has really come down in price. How can we make sure that they get access to the airwaves in order to be able to um, broadcast? Uh, and the FCC released a 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, allowed tribes to claim it for free before they're auctioning it off, which is a great, great, great band in order to broadcast rurally. It goes pretty far, it goes through leaves. It's almost perfect for this type of deployment. And then lastly, it's about the operations. How do you make it sustainable? And that's where open source uh, cores are a huge part of it. Uh, if, uh, if you have to always pay someone to manage your core, it's gonna be some cost that you don't have much control of, you can't predict. So the idea is what can we use that is low or no cost, start them off, and then help build that internal capacity so then they can decide whether they want to stick with their, running their own core or maybe move on to another type of technology or maybe have some sort of shared management. So that's one thing that we've really loved about Magma uh, in that it's accessible, it's fairly reliable, and well, it's free. You can download it off of GitHub. So Miranot was founded in 2017 by a bunch of volunteers and uh, what we were tackling was the tribal digital divide. Uh, connectivity on tribal lands is much worse than anywhere else in the country. And what we felt is in order to make the world more equitable and in order to bridge the homework gap, we could find an, a way to get connectivity to the homes. When uh, indigenous peoples had their lands taken, they were pushed into the corners of the United States that were more difficult, were harder to live, were um, more challenging. Uh, but in the, even then, if we look at connectivity rates for tribal people, living on lands versus non-tribal people living on lands. It seems like the gap is always, uh, tribal folks seem to have about half the connectivity no matter what metric we're looking at compared to their rural counterparts. So as a nonprofit, what we do is when we partner with our um, tribal partners, we leverage donations, we leverage volunteers, we leverage testing um, in Silicon Valley. So we did a lot of testing in order to improve upon magma. However, that's not a sustainable model. So I came across FreedomFi because they were developing the, the business case, if you will, that was appealing to our partners, uh, where they have these small or medium-sized networks. Most of them are under 100 homes. And the FreedomFi platform to give them the confidence that they would continue to get the technical support that they were getting from our Silicon Valley volunteers, um, that was huge. That was absolutely huge to have a company that they can count on, to have a number that they can call, to feel like there was someone who had their back as they ran their networks. Well, it's definitely empowering communities to bring connectivity to themselves. And it is interesting because we talk about use case, I would actually posit it's use cases. There's 574 sovereign nations within the United States. That means 574 different value systems, different rules, different terrains, all of it. So it's really a, I see it as um, a lot of innovation that's gonna happen. Some people will do SpaceX. Some people will do um, the micro geos that are out there. Some people will do open source, uh, open 5GS versus Magma versus all sorts of different things. The combinatorics Torx problem actually has all the use sites it needs in the United States in order to test out these technologies. And like Boris alluded to, these are sovereign nations. They can roll it out fast. They don't have to worry about a lot of stuff and they just move so agilely and will find Freedom Fi so many interesting problems as they already have. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, just this weekend alone, we're gonna be helping launch three new networks. Uh, where do you get to do that in a weekend? I would say that it's um, both. Uh, some of our partners, Navajo Technical University, for example, uh, Diné College, a lot of the tribal universities um, and a lot of the tribes, they are putting together their own ISPs. Um, they're the ones who are making completely new business cases uh, for sustainability that's not necessarily based on a capitalistic system. It just doesn't work with a lot of the communal cultures. And yeah, they're putting together tech stacks. I mean, what, I, what I'm seeing happening in Alaska, if you wanna know communities that can make things happen by their, on their own, some of these villages, and sometimes you think it's just gonna be, uh, uh, how should we say, duct tape and, uh, WD-40, but uh, no, I was just talking to um, Alaska Group 
this morning, and they're taking existing infrastructure DSL modems, and they're re, uh, redoing the architecture of their network. So that port one is your typical connection to the internet, port three connects you to the clinic, and port four connects you to the school. Where are you gonna see that? I mean, tons of innovation happening within these communities. That was so awesome. Thank you so much, Mariel. We do have her on the call today. So if anyone has any questions, we do have a couple uh, minutes. So feel free to jump off mute and ask away. Amazing, uh, Prakash here. And uh, especially to the people from the tribal folks, what do you find exciting about Freedom Fi? because that is one thing which I have heard from every one of you. What did we hear Freedom 5 today? Yeah, no, what do you think positive, what exactly is the value that Freedom 5 brings to you? So what Freedom 5 brings to us is um, they help us uh, make sure we have a stable, um, stable orchestrator. We have a lot of folks, I'm here with, with Bruce, who's honestly, you just started working with Magla about five hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, here, and we're putting together a network. We're testing out 20 different CPEs that'll eventually be passed out. And this is great for tier one support. We can do that. But when it comes to something going weird, we can jump on the Slack channel and talk to FreedomFly and they can help us figure out what's going on. Um, Magma's still young, still has some quirks, but it's really great to have that safety net. Um, they're running an open source software, they're doing it themselves. And you, that takes a certain amount of courage, but it also takes um, support you can count on. So that's a good example of a great partner. Fantastic. I mean, no pressure, Freedom Fi. Is this the portion where we get to ask for features, Kendall? I mean, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you can put it out there. <laughs> well, what's one thing that's really interesting here, um, and a lot of the uh, reservations, the bigger ones, they um, they have uh, they don't have to worry about boundary constrictions or anything like that. So what's neat, what's happening here in Bishop, where essentially you're about a, a mile and a half by a mile. Yeah, about a mile. So to have um, really easy controls of power outputs and such, um, so that they can make sure they're working within bounding condition, uh, conditions. There's the three five two five mix, which seems to be working really well. Um, and I see in the chat someone's talking about Wi-Fi roaming, um, cellular roaming for mobile. There's so many things that folks want to do here in order to make these sustainable and make sure that they can bring connectivity to their people. Are you taking notes, Kendall? This is great, she's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I really want to extend my appreciation to the community out there that are making this happen. Uh, the idea of private LTE and um, small groups being able to start their own um, networks uh, wouldn't be possible without what Magma has done. It's just, the subscriber cost or the, the cost of uh, other cores are simply just prohibitive. So you all are doing some amazing work and seriously from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And, and it's really great for us too. It makes us feel like we're, you know, we're helping out a lot. It feels, it feels like we're at the tip of the spear here using the, the very beginning of this new public, uh, public availability for a technology that used to be uh, only available to you know, the giant telecom. And now it's little guys like us that are being able to use that. 